Hi, and welcome to the third in this presentation of a uh, potted, uh, potted version of the CPD I was doing before lockdown. And the same way as last time, I'm going to just uh, shrink myself down. This presentation I've entitled um, Why Holistic Now? Because uh, it wasn't before. Well, um, medicine, surgery and pharmacology, all our efforts in this are actually directed towards improving the mind-body complex's ability to heal itself. We don't actually do the healing, it's the body that does it, and we need to promote that. Prevention works, nothing much else does. And at the moment, only 25, at the most, only 25% of our cells are human. Without a healthy microbiome, we get ill and we die. An example of that would be a Clostridium difficile, and by restoring the microbiome, that is a much better cure than uh, anything else that we've got. There have been no new drugs to combat mental health in the last 20 years. The neuroscientists believe that, that this may be because of a mistake in the original premise, and that uh, progress on mental health has been uh, held back by adherence to the sort of Cartesian dualism. Professor Ed Bulmore has written a book called The Inflamed Mind and uh, he's convinced that the inflammatory cytokines pass the blood-brain barrier and have a role to play in mental health. Inflammation, the immune system and brain function are intimately connected. There have been no new antibiotics in 20 years. And the microbiologists are emphasizing the importance of the microbiome and the estrobolome and, and various other biomes and bolomes. Um, the incidence of heart disease, stroke, diabetes, obesity and cancer remains high despite our best efforts and despite advances. So what are we missing and what have the scientists been doing? This is a study which caught my eye, and it's uh, uh, 2017 America, where they're looking at the, com the causes of death, and the commonest cause of death is a heart attack, uh, not surprisingly. Now, I want to just go back to uh, the uh, Framingham Heart Studies, which started in 1948. I'm sure you, you, you all remember this, but I'll, I'll, I'll just go through it. They, they took 5,000 people, and they decided that they would look at them every two years. And Framingham was a town which they described as any town, uh, so that it was supposedly a cross-section. The problem was it, was, it wasn't a cross-section. Uh, they were mainly turned out in the end to be a middle-class, white, um, very low divorce rate for America, very good diet, lots of exercise, and not surprisingly, the results of the study showed that high blood, blood pressure, cholesterol, age, diabetes, these were the drivers of uh, heart disease according to the Framingham Heart Studies. However, these factors only account for half the cases. What about the other half? And what about the effects of uh, uh, on, on people who have got high blood pressure anyway. Now the problem is that the health services adhere to these findings and studiously ignore the real drivers, which if we go back to the concept of the beverage report of 1942, uh, you will remember that uh, uh, they were trying to address poverty uh, low educational attainment, social inequality and stress and social isolation. And there is absolutely no doubt that heart disease is brought on by mismanaged emotions such as uh, depression, anxiety, anger and hostility. But they are brought on by these bigger factors, the factors of, of life that people have to lead. And hopelessness in middle-aged men carries the same risk as a packet of cigarettes a day. There's a bigger issue when we look at why wasn't the beverage report uh, implemented, and that is at government level, and it's a government that has to take an holistic approach, not just to the individual, but to the planet as well. 
and it's driven by the way we look at our economy and we have to take a more holistic approach uh, which is what I mentioned in the, in the last presentation. And what is happening to people who have heart disease and cancer is that they fall into this zone of human uh, deprivation. Not all the way down, but they're just crossing the line. And we need to move that line if we want to actually improve the standard of health in, uh, uh, in, in any country. Second commonest cause of death, and there is no doubt that the superhighway to both those conditions is mismanaged emotions. But it's the third cause of death that alarmed me most, and there's a prize for it. There are no stupid answers, because the most stupid answer of all is actually the correct one. And the answer is medical errors. So why medical errors and what have been scientists been doing over the last 20 years? This is an advert for a cure-all. And the answer would be, are you interested? Are you interested in what this is and would you like some of it? Well, you can have it because it's free. It's sleep. And sleep has been around since Asclepius and 3,000 years. Asclepius, the god of uh, medicine, healing, physicians, and also, of course, the god of rejuvenation for those people who want to stay young. Very big medical family, of course. Uh, his daughter was Hygieia, so they were interested in cross-infection control. He had another child called Panacea. And uh, there's a little in painting there of, of, of um, meeting Hippocrates. So this was the birth of medicine and sleep was considered to be absolutely paramount. It was then, and you know what? It is now, in my view. Because if sleep does not serve an absolutely vital function, then it is the biggest mistake the evolutionary process ever made. Earth, would you be wasting your time sleeping for if it wasn't absolutely necessary? This is a nice big study, isn't it? Sample size 1.5 billion humans. That's right, it's daylight saving. And with daylight saving, what happens on the Monday after the spring ch time changes is that you get a 24% increase in the daily rate of myocardial, acute myocardial infarction. And just to do it the other way around, like all good science, in the autumn, when you have an extra hour in bed, hopefully asleep, you get an associated 21% reduction. So it works both ways. And that's really really important and the other thing that i have to point out of course is that this is the daily rate if we take the month or certainly the two months around it then the rate of myocardial infarction is exactly the same so these people who have their heart attacks they're the same people who would have had them anyway but what it's telling us is that just one hour sleep deprivation has got an amazing physiological effect. And that if you do that day after day after day, then this is not going to be a good thing. There are similar figures for road traffic accidents. But that's not the same. Because these are incidents that would never have occurred. So the injuries and death associated, they're genuine. That's just a thought for you. Why medical errors? Anybody know who this guy is? He's probably one of the most famous doctors in the world. He's responsible for all the training of American doctors. He's responsible for the concept of internships and of doctors working 24 hours in, around the clock in the hospital. And his name is 
William Stuart Halstead. He reckoned that doctors needed to work very long hours to learn, they needed to work without sleep in order to be practised at it, and they needed to work the way he did. You all do it the way I do. And that's why he set up the internships and he ruled them. But he had one dirty secret, and the dirty secret he had was he was a cocaine addict. We know this because in the end he checked himself in for rehabilitation into a private hospital, not under the name of Holstead, but under the name of William Stewart. And what did they do for him? Well, they introduced him to morphine in order to get him off the cocaine. And he re-emerged from his rehabilitation as both a cocaine and a morphine addict and continued to work. And that internships, they, they carried on. But recently, over uh, reasonably recently, there was a law passed in America that interns in their first year, that they would, were not to work the long hours. They were to get enough sleep because it was very bad for them. But the wording of the law was such that that only applies in your first year. Once you enter your second year of internship, all bets are off. They can make you work any hours that they want. And as far as I'm aware, that is still the law in America. There's a lot of pressure in this country now. And recently there was the case of the doctor who had to handle the whole department, made a mistake and then was struck off the register because the General Medical Council didn't really understand what the importance of sleep deprivation is. That's a disgrace. You know, that really is a disgrace. And a medical and dental profession should be doing something about our governing body who are there. Oh, I'm not, sure. I'm not entirely sure where they are there anymore. They don't seem to be uh, functioning the way they should. I better leave that. <laughs> So, medical errors. Sleep deprivation. Less than six hours sleep, and you will get a 170% increase in the risk of serious surgical errors. Errors of 400% if the sleep is deprived for 22 hours, and that's that was that doctor that made the mistakes. And let's also remember that doctors who work in accident and emergency long sessions overnight, they have an increase of 168% in road traffic accidents on the way home. So they will end up straight back in the accident and emergency unit that they have just left, but this time as a patient. So sleep is incredibly important and we will be moving on to discuss that in greater detail so the next one of these little presentations is why we sleep I'm then going to talk about the effects of poor sleep and then we're going to talk about the therapeutic use of hypnosis uh, in terms of a uh, part of the holistic approach so Thank you very much for listening um, and uh, I will see you for the next um, the, the, the next presentation. <laughs>